They said it would never last. But like the spirit of the Wild West, Clark County wrangled its way through 100 years. And not only did we survive, we thrived. We were simply a watering stop for weary travelers from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. Now we're two million people strong and continue to be one of the fastest growing places in the nation. So how did it happen? Well, we celebrate our centennial by looking back at what made Clark County what it is today. We start by taking a look at a few Clark County museums, the places that hold the key to our county's past. It's not a warm and fuzzy concept, but it's a very important part of 20th century history. And the people who come here, uh, as they go through, a lot of times they come in with a little trepidation about the subject matter. And when they leave, they usually say, wow, I didn't know any of this stuff. Yep, if you want to get to know nuclear power, the Atomic Testing Museum packs a powerful punch. Just a mile away from the Strip, it's the only one of its kind in the world. Starting in 1951, folks flocked to the desert to watch the giant mushroom clouds rise over the valley. But the Nevada test site, 65 miles outside of Vegas, feared fallout hazards and stopped above ground testing in 62. Underground testing continued until 1992. While the explosions may have shook just the valley, the impact on nuclear testing could be felt around the world. This museum is really important not only to Southern Nevada, but I believe very strongly on a national level. For over 50 years, the test site employed hundreds of thousands of people. And along with gambling, it was probably the major income-driven industry, if you want to call it that. So for us, it's a really important part of the history of how this area developed and has grown. It captures a very important part of 20th century history that actually became part of the mindset and pop culture of a whole era, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. Three, two, one. So there's a lot of things that this museum can teach us about a very difficult uh, period in our recent history and also hopefully teach us some lessons about how to proceed in the future as well. During the Cold War, the above ground testing served as a show of fierce power against our enemies. But for folks in Clark County, it was a highly anticipated spectacle that everyone wanted to see. My brother was in a scout troop that um, uh, their scoutmaster was a welder out of the test site. And he knew when all these, they would be furloughed so they could do the testing. They would take the entire Boy Scout troop and cubs up there. They woke them up at 2 o'clock in the morning and marched them up above Cold Creek Ranger Station to the top of the mountain. And there he gave them all welder's glasses and said, now, when it first starts, you keep the welder's glasses on. Then after it gets going a while, you can take them off and look at it. You know, they, they marched those little fellers right up the mountain to watch it at 45 miles away from ground zero. As soon as it went off, you could see the mushroom cloud come up. Well, first of all, you could see the light. Even if it was 10 o'clock in the morning, you always could see that bright, bright light. And so that would be the first thing that would attract our attention. And of course, you're out playing dodgeball or something, you know. Now, mind you, a few minutes before, we had been under our desk for safety. Now we're standing out there watching the thing go off and watching it drift toward us. Like Judy, Raymond knew the drill, spending a lot of his youth under his little wooden desk, a safety exercise just in case the big one hit. I'm old enough that I remember ducking cover. And you know what? I didn't believe that was going to work even when I was a kid. Uh, but anyway, I remember it. But in this case contains a, a lot of uh, memories and memorabilia from that era. There were a lot of uh, popular songs, My Atomic Baby and all sorts of crazy stuff. I was a Superman fan. And I remember that comic book, Superboy, the atomic Superboy, uh, was a lot of fun. And of course, the comic books really uh, picked up on the entire atomic bomb culture. You saw a lot of that. And how about this for a pop culture cutie, Miss Atomic Bomb? There was a real cannon that shot atomic bombs out at the test site, and it was called Atomic Annie. And this is a model of the howitzer that was used to actually fire those atomic bombs. And you used to be able to go into a toy store and buy atomic anti cannons to take home and play with. My absolute favorite item, though, in this case, 
is the Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Lab. Not exactly kid-friendly. This kit was designed by one of the guys who helped build the A-bomb. They didn't end up making too many. The cost was too high. And if you can find a complete kit like this today, it would set you back about 10 grand. But you would get a nifty jar of radium among your supplies. Well, this is without a doubt the favorite uh, spot in the museum for almost all our visitors. It's a reconstructed bunker uh, that you would have found out at the test site. And then we have benches in our little bunker, uh, similar to what was out on the ground to the test site. People would go out and sit a mile or two away from the blast and literally just sit there and watch these explosions. It was pretty incredible. We have a six minute video that recreates those experiences, even to the point of the rushing shock waves that uh, impacts the visitors as the story is being told. The benches rumble, of course. It's, it's very dramatic. Uh, we present a very, very balanced view of what happened at the test site. We understand that there were a lot of people who uh, were very much opposed to the testing of nuclear weapons. And uh, we include that as part of the story. Whether you are for it or against it, the mushroom helped to put Clark County on the map. But hundreds of years before the first awe-inspiring explosion, the Anasazi Indians simply and quietly worked the land. The artifacts in the museum actually range in date from probably about 8,000 years ago on up through the Puebloan period, the Anasazi, that's what we have the most artifacts from that era, about a thousand years old, and even up into the historic baskets of the Southern Paiute people. A lot of our baskets were created in about 1900, so we cover a really long period of history here. The Lost City Museum was actually created in 1936 and it was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps to house artifacts that were being excavated in the area that they knew would be covered by waters of Lake Mead when the dam was finished. The museum was built, the artifacts were brought here, and this has been used as a museum continuously since that time. Preserving our past can be costly. This part of the museum was actually built to protect and cover this ancient site. They're really a tangible connection for people to the deep past. A lot of people moved to southern Nevada with not a lot of history here. When you look at these artifacts, you get a greater understanding of just how long people have been living in this inhospitable desert. They've been here for thousands of years, so it's kind of a lesson to us of just what can be done here. Like the back-breaking work that went into this crude shelter, a pit house was a place to find relief from the desert sun, if only for a moment. With nothing else but their bare hands and sticks, they would dig down about three or four feet, put up support posts, and then create a roof using brush and dirt. This is an actual site location and when the archaeologists found it, it would have just looked like a kind of a little depression in the ground and then they excavated and took all of the dirt out that through the thousand years is just blown back in. From underground digs to adobe dwellings, the Anasazi and Pueblo would have built these in AD 1100 to 1150. They were recreated here using the same method used thousands of years ago. These are houses built of sticks and mud. They've been here since 1936, so they're 70 years old, and they're still standing. There are um, still sites and artifacts. Um, a lot of times um, when houses are built or new developments or new roads are put in, we see more sites and more artifacts. Most of what we do is, is what we call salvage archaeology, and that we try to preserve the information and save the artifacts so that everyone can learn something. It can be a hard line of work in a place where history tends to disappear faster than you can say, new strip mall. We usually get around 25,000 to 30,000 people a year to visit here, and they come from all over the world. We've had visitors from South Africa, we've had them from Ukraine. A lot of people just see what sits in Las Vegas now. When they look at these things that people made and created here those many, many hundreds and thousands of years ago, it really is kind of a surprise to realize that there's more out here than, than just the bright lights and city streets. From the sparse existence of the Anasazi 
to the modern settlements of Clark County. This house was built in 1912 and only cost $2,500. Will and Leva Beckley, who used to own the best clothing store in town, built it. It used to be in downtown Las Vegas, right where the Fitzgerald sits today. But they picked it up and moved it here to the Clark County Museum's Heritage Street. A stroll down this street is like a walk through time. Historic homes rescued from the wrecking ball were moved here to capture a snapshot of different periods in local history. The Beckley home, whose style is California bungalow and represents the 1920s, was the first house moved out to the museum back in 1979. Before the house was moved here, we're told that Leva would sit right here in her rocking chair and watch her sleepy little community roll by, a sight that the museum's curator and lifelong resident remembers well. I mean, something that you see in its original location and then to, to end up working where it ends up and then being able to, to decorate it. And, and almost everything in that house is original to the family. They gave us a lot of the original furnishing. The bedroom set, the chair, the lamp, all originals. And that's Leva right there. Leva's daughter, Virginia, remembers her favorite part of the house. The dining room table there where we had all our discussions and always had meals together there. Dad always served the plates and everything. While the food was hot, the house wasn't always. In the house, we had no heat other than our stove in the kitchen, you know, which heated water and everything. And we had little kerosene stoves and a little electric heaters we used. And then we had a fireplace. And my brother used to have to go out and bring the coal in and chop the kindling. And that was always a problem, you know, whether he did it or not. And of course, we had no refrigerator except the old wooden ones. And you guessed it, no air conditioning either. Older homes had windows on all sides for cross ventilation. The museum's curator remembers those open windows didn't always do the job against scorching desert heat. My mom grew up here, and what they would do in the summertime is wet the sheets before they got into bed, and then you'd sleep in wet sheets. Yeah, this is the under stairwell closet, and the clothing in there is all levas, and the steamer trunk is their trunk, too. They were pretty well off compared to my family, and so there were, you know, they had carpeting on the floor long before we did. Judy Hamblin, a lifelong resident of Clark County, grew up in government housing. This type of home was built to house the families that worked at the basic magnesium plant. We're looking at a home from World War II. It was a government built home in Henderson. I mean, the whole city of Henderson was a government town. Uh, the exterior's at Redwood, and that's one of the reasons why these houses were supposed to be temporary. Uh, you'll notice on the inside, it's quarter inch plywood covered with battens. Not a lot of insulation either. Judy lived in the fourth townsite home ever built. She remembers just how temporary those homes were supposed to be. And there was no no filler, no insulation in between the outside wall, a stud, and the inside wall. That was it. So, of course, they were very hot and they were very cold, and frankly, they were also very open, and sometimes wind would whistle through there. Judy remembers the nicest thing about those houses were the mailboxes. They were actually made of glass, but installing them was a whole other story. It would take five men to come along and do each one. One would unpack it, Another one would screw this one. They'd take turns doing it, but it took five men to put it up, and uh, which was interesting because it was like 19 years before we ever had home delivery. But we all had home, <laughs> we all had mailboxes on the edge of our, our houses. There's a whole lot more to see out here. A casino owner's house from the 1950s, complete with supplies for a bomb shelter. A 1948 Spartanette. This came from the Golden Ruler trailer park on Boulder Highway. There's even a house moved out here from Goldfield from the 1920s. Inside here, you'll find a desert cooler. It looks like a chicken coop, but it's actually an old-fashioned fridge. There's even more to see in the main building. And if you're lucky enough to run into this guy, you'll hear the stories behind the stories. You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's, it's a new slogan. It's not a new idea. In, in the, during Prohibition, stills were all over the countryside here. There were stills out along the river, there were stills up at St. George, there were stills down in El Dorado Canyon, there were stills just out in, in the desert all over here. And to give you an idea, if you went to Arizona just across the river, it was $50 a gallon to buy a gallon of booze over there. 
It was a dollar a gallon in Clark County. We had Sam Gay as sheriff at that point. Sam had stopped drinking years before when he'd gotten drunk one night and shot out all the new electric lights on Fremont Street, and the judge told him he had to stop drinking. So he did, but he didn't really believe in prohibition, you know, and so he didn't enforce it particularly hard. That's an interesting part of understanding the sort of mindset of the community here. You know, it was a hardworking community, but, you know, we're out in the West, don't, don't give us a lot of laws we don't agree with. The museum, founded back in the 60s, was turned over to the county in 1976, moving from its home in downtown Henderson to its current location on Boulder Highway. <coughs> Standing at the entrance, you'll find a mama dire wolf protecting her cubs in prehistoric times. And take a look at some of the county's earliest gaming. We get things sometimes from the casinos here. If they're shutting down a casino, Sometimes they'll call us and say, would you like a representative collection, you know, and we'll get a couple of chips and a swizzle stick and the header off of a slot machine. You know, all the things that help us to tell that story of all of us, of our community. And in another part of the museum, meet Miss Nancy. That's what it's all about. Who was um, Cinderella on Romper Room here for years and years and years, back in the 50s and 60s. And she gave us one of her dresses and some footage and some other things from her time on, on television. Before television sets were even sold, another exhibit digs deeper into our past. From Searchlight to Gold Springs, mines could be found all over the county. Mining was a hard way of life, but these brave men helped build our community. Most people who come to Las Vegas, come to Clark County, tend to have the sort of Oliver Stone view of history. You know, Bugsy Siegel showed up in the middle of the desert, said, let there be flamingo, and Las Vegas grew up out of the sand. It didn't happen that way. And what they come out with is this idea of, wow, this is interesting, this is neat. I didn't know this was out here. I didn't know we had all this history. From humble beginnings and simpler times to the ultimate in glitz and glamour, this is Liberace's hand-painted Rolls Royce. It wasn't an actual working car. He used it as a prop on stage, and it's said to be among one of his favorites. Now it sits here in the Liberace Museum, built by the man himself nearly 30 years ago. The museum started in the building that is at the corner of Tropicana and Spencer, and I think a lot of people think that that's all that we are. But we are, in fact, in two theaters. The theater one holds our pianos and cars, and then here in theater two, you have the wonderful costume gallery with the jewelry collection and some beautiful antiques. It can quickly become sensory overload here. This piano with its 40,000 plus Swarovski crystals is one that we've used here in our entertainment space. It was the last piano that he played his final encore performance at Radio City Music Hall. If you're really lucky, you might get a crack at the nine-foot mirror in Baldwin, like one talented tourist from Florida did. Then, there's the costumes. This costume is the heaviest non-fur costume in the collection. Fully dressed, he was wearing over 204 pounds of costuming. Even when the cape was removed, he was then wearing a 70-pound jumpsuit. That combined with rings, he got a workout every time he played. And remember the Rolls Royce? Well, how about a little bling to go with it? I got uh, 24 rubies after nine diamonds. Is that what you got? For people who never saw Liberace or heard him, it's kind of a, a visual overstimulation wherever you look here. Uh, that's one of the favorite costumes of all the guests who come to the museum. People love him in this red, white, and blue, be it the camp, the fun, or the patriotism. He had it all. Need a little more glitz? How about this 115,000 carat, 50 pound rhinestone made for Liberace by the Swarovski family. But as he received, he also gave, giving back to the community with which he was deeply involved. He started his foundation in 76, and since that time, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas College of Fine Arts has received over $325,000 in scholarships. The number of students that that has impacted is uh, significant. It carries forward to the other 120 schools that his foundation has funded. So uh, his legacy truly was for all of the arts, and his impact has reached this community significantly. Liberace also took care of his pooches. He had lots of them. 
26 actually. He left $50,000 for them in a trust and he took care of other dogs too. I've literally had guests come in here, locals who said, oh, we took our dog to the groomer one day and Liberace showed up with five or six of his and everybody's grooming was on Liberace that day. That's just how fun and generous he was. You know, can you imagine taking your dog and seeing Liberace's dog prancing out of the limo? Yeah. A lot of fun. He was real to this community and, and not only to the headliner community but to the, to the residents of this community and we hear that all the time. Let's not forget, this man was the ultimate performer. Liberace's legacy in this community dates back to before many, many headliners. He performed here the first time in 1944 at what was then called The Last Frontier and from there went on to have a career that just literally put the city on the map and put other entertainers that he shared the stage with on the map. Oh, I have the most expensive accompanies in show business. Not really, I work for the government at a percentage. In 55, he was the highest paid entertainer on the strip and he opened the Riviera and that was the beginning of the costume legacy. I'm always on the lookout for something new and unusual in the world of entertainment. Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Chinese acrobats of Taiwan. So he brought entertainment and showmanship to this town very, very early on. Before there was a Cirque, before there was a Bet, before there was a Cher, there was a one-name artist here, and Liberace was giving it to his audiences for another 40 years. <laughs> From flashy, flamboyant style to the ultimate in flyboy fashion. But it wasn't all about the looks. These actually served a purpose. Flying in open cockpits, the engine would spit back oil on the pilot's face and they needed to wipe off all the gunk and grime. Now by the end of the flight, these scars would be filthy. We're at the Howard Cannon Aviation Museum inside McCarran International Airport. You can find all kinds of interesting stuff about the county's long aviation history here. In 1958, two men took off in a Cessna 172 from McCarran Field in Las Vegas, Nevada. 64 days later, they landed. Robert Tim and John Cook flew for 64 days, 22 hours, 19 minutes, and 5 seconds without touching ground. They refueled twice a day, had everything that they needed, water, food, everything, uh, handed up by rope to the plane as they were flying. You can see the picture here showing the, the truck on the road and the plane above it keeping the plane and the truck parallel for two and a half minutes twice a day. The fellow standing in the back of the truck had to have a helmet on because every so often the plane would hit an air pocket and would drop and so they'd bounce the wheels off his head. So you had to have a lot of coordination between the, the fellows that were actually in the truck and the two uh, pilots in the plane. Even though they took off and landed at McCarran, they flew over Blythe Air Force Base because that was closed down, but it was a large field and it was lit at night. And they knew if they had an emergency, they'd be able to come in there. And the big question, how did these guys go to the bathroom? In this case, they had a little folding camp stool, and that's what they used. And according to Gwen Cook, who was John Cook's widow, she always said that was probably why it was so green around Blight. The museum's been open since 1993 with exhibits in the Henderson Executive and North Las Vegas Airport. A lot of the collection came from the Crockett's, the actual founders of the airport. The original McCarran Field is what is now Nellis Air Force Base. Originally founded in 1929 as Simon Field, became McCarran Field in 1941, and then it was run by the Army Air Corps during World War II. We had both commercial and military on that. At the end of the war, the airfield was going to be reopened by the Air Force, but we had to move commercial traffic somewhere else. So that's when they came over, negotiated with the Crockett's, took over the lease on this airfield, and the county opened it up as McCarran Field at that point, the Clark County Municipal Airport, and then it's changed its name to McCarran International Airport. And today, nearly 50 million people fly in and out of this airport a year. But the very first flight into Las Vegas was almost 90 years ago. Touching down at what is now the parking lot of the Sahara Hotel. The pilot stayed, giving flights to the locals for 10 bucks each. He got more than he bargained for when he took up an elder Paiute Indian from one of the local tribes. When he flew, he actually passed out, which was unfortunate because he fell forward on the stick, which put the plane in a nosedive and Randall had to really wrench it back up. Didn't crash. One of our most famous frequent flyers was a good friend of the Crockett's. 
One of the things about Howard Hughes that people don't know, he started flying in here in the late 40s and 50s and fly into McCarran, but he'd fly into the Crockett's fixed base operation, and he'd say, can I borrow your house? And he would go over and make a bunch of phone calls all over the world, because he knew the phones weren't tapped. It was a safe place. His impact here was immense. He bought Air West, making it Hughes Air West, which became a major carrier in the late 60s and 70s. That's the, the flying banana, as it was called. And they played up on that. It was the first time that an airline consciously hired a designer to come in and give them a look. Back when the yellow banana was in the air, nobody would have guessed in just 30 short years, McCarran would become one of the seventh busiest airports in the country. An amazing growth rate. And a, a growth rate that, that when you look back at the history of the airport, every time they've tried to plan for as big as it was going to get, we always hit that faster than we ever think that we're going to. The, the growth rate here has been phenomenal, and anybody who lives here has seen that in their lives. If you want to learn more about our county's museums, just log on to our website and make sure to join us next time as we continue to leap back and look forward at 100 years of Clark County history.